Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us this evening for, for those of you in Pakistan. And if you're joining us from elsewhere, thank you for joining as well. Uh, my name is Aaron Tiffany. I'm an economic officer here at the U.S. Embassy in Islamabad. And as one of my uh, portfolio responsibilities, I cover information and communication technology as well as cybersecurity. Um, so we're happy to have another installment of our program with our public affairs colleagues here at the embassy to talk about another um, uh, hot topic in the information technology space, uh, and that is 5G. So uh, tonight we have a very special uh, guest speaker uh, that I'd like to take a moment to introduce. Uh, Melissa Hathaway is the president of Hathaway Global Strategies and is a leading expert in cyberspace policy and cybersecurity, which she leverages for both public and private sector clients. Uh, most notably, she served in two U.S. presidential administrations, spearheading the cyberspace policy review uh, for President Barack Obama and leading the comprehensive national cybersecurity initiative for President George W. Bush. Uh, Ms. Hathaway stood up the cybersecurity office within the national security staff and set the expectation and pace to move the, to, to move the United States towards a strong and more resilient information and communications infrastructure. Uh, at the conclusion of her government service, she received the National Intelligence Reform Medal and the National Intelligence Meritorious Unit Citation Medal in recognition of her achievements. Having served on the board of, uh, board of directors for two public companies and three nonprofit organizations, and as a strategic advisor to a number of public and private companies, Ms. Hathaway brings a unique combination of policy and technical expertise, as well as boardroom experience that allows her to help clients better understand the intersection of government policy, developing technological and industry trends, and economic drivers that impact acquisition and business development strategy. Ms. Hathaway holds a BA from the American University in Washington, DC. She has completed a graduate studies in international economics and technology transfer policy, and as a graduate of the US Armed Forces Staff College with a special certificate in information operations. Uh, so I wanna thank Ms. Hathaway for joining us tonight and I would like to turn the floor over to her. Thank you, Aaron. That was a beautiful introduction. <clears throat> Very generous and good evening to everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here today or this evening and to talk to you about 5G. Um, and I look forward to your questions uh, throughout this uh, throughout this uh, conversation this evening. Um, <clears throat> and so I, I really want to first uh, set the stage of it's really important to kind of look at the internet just turned 51 in 2020, October 29th, 1969. And um, it really was uh, uh, not envisioned to be the backbone of the, of the digital economy. Uh, and as you know, it was originally designed to be a research platform and, uh, and a communications platform um, for uh, really crisis management if there was a, um, an issue with uh, and enabling our military to uh, communicate. But the internet <clears throat> largely became uh, the platform for commerce. It started in 1985 and uh, the internet that we know and began really using was um, launched in 1990 with the, the World Wide Web and us being able to click, connect, and search information all around the world. And many of our countries really started to embrace and engage uh, on the internet in the 1990s, really around mid-1990s is when it started to take off. And that's really when the global economy started to become digitized, is in the mid-1990s, early 2000s. And today, the global economy is worth about a little over $100 trillion. And the uh, digital economy is worth about 15% of that, um, a little over $15 trillion. And each of our countries are on a different maturity path for um, embracing and engaging and optimizing on that digital economy. The United States is at uh, about 7%. And, um, and here uh, in, in Pakistan, you're, um, you're, just, you're just at increasing in just about 6% next year. And there are paths and strategies by the government and by industry to really, how do you accelerate that digital transformation and accelerate your percentage of the digital economy? 
Um, and that's going to be based on really having um, good connectivity. Telecommunications is the largest contributor to the digital economy. Internet penetration does matter, and it really has to be available, affordable, and resilient um, so that each of our citizens can actually capitalize on, um, on that and, and embrace and engage on the, on the internet and the digital economic platforms. Pakistan's digital access is increasing. Um, among your, uh, your uh, community, you've got about 43% penetration on the internet and over at 99% mobile users. And so you're using those handheld devices and connecting to the internet. You're starting to see innovation of the applications and wide use of the applications uh, to, uh, to participate and engage. And then I'm gonna be using a lot of um, uh, uh, notes here tonight about the internet of things and how we're starting to connect more people, places and things to the internet and how important that is for, um, again, enabling the growth of more users, the enabling of the digital economy and the dependence. So the pandemic over the last year, now um, almost going on uh, 14 months, uh, is showing us that the digital transformation of businesses is not a choice, but it's an imperative. And you started to see new business models emerge. The intermediaries are being removed from how we engage with um, either the internet or the digital economy. And you're starting to see more um, changes in consumer and customer behavior because we are going direct to the supermarket um, and having uh, things delivered online. And that becomes really important as you start to see how things are, are, are changing. We also saw that over the course of this last year in 2020, companies um, have prioritized their digital transformation because you have a work from home now workforce and they had to change the way that their digital footprint um, really uh, was managed and, and had to be accelerated in order to enable the work from home and still be able to deliver goods and services, data and capital across borders. That increase in remote work at 300% is going to stay steady for this year and potentially into the next year or next two years as we start to um, accelerate and get our, our um, employees and our citizens vaccinated uh, against the different variants. And you're starting to see a, a very, again, a 40% increase in, in, in the changing in the customer interactions. And if you just think about it, even tonight we're communicating and we're, we're participating over Zoom, Zoom, MS Teams, WebEx, et cetera, all of the platforms that are keeping us connected. It's also changing the way that we are, in fact, exchanging information, uh, building on each other's ideas and the like. But we also saw over the course of this last year that our telecommunications infrastructure is in fact fragile. Um, we uh, have saw um, Tata Communications had a worldwide outage. IBM had a worldwide cloud outage. We saw uh, London have a six hour um, outage um, of its telecommunications infrastructure. Here in the United States, we had um, a, a 5G tower um, destroyed and AT&T's communications uh, went down in uh, our Southeast region. We've seen Amazon, Equinix, and many of the other cloud providers actually also have outages. And so we have to start to build resilience into this telecommunications infrastructure um, and, uh, and, and continue as we build out so we need a high speed. So this digital transformation is uh, based on, um, is going to be enabled by 5G and we're gonna need high speed, low latency networks. Um, and it's an essential for enabling that uh, digital transformation. The uh, technology path of the evolution is, you know, the, the 1G was the mobile communications in the 1980s. Uh, just voice. And then 2G was 1990s, and it started to get us better reach for voice. Uh, in the 2000s, we saw 3G, which what our countries all still have this, it started to allow for mobile data. 4G allowed for more broadband expansion um, and more data exchange. And 5G is going to, is a unified, it's a very unique platform. Um, it's going to uh, enable for new network functionality that's virtualized. It's going to enable for soft 
where defined networking, and it's going to um, really kind of unify or uh, decouple our hardware and software, but and merge our personal infrastructures with our national infrastructures. And so it brings about a whole new challenge of thinking about security and resilience, but so many opportunities as well, because it allow for five gigabits per second for um, high speed downlinks and uplink packet access. So again, it allows for that innovation at the edge and for new um, applications and new, new applications of this technology to the different vertical sectors. And it's 5G is different because there's no longer a distinct, distinguishing element between the network, its core and its edge. Today in the 3G, 4G infrastructures, we have devices that we communicate with, but the data is processed in a single entity at the core, a data center, your telecommunications um, hub. But as we start to move to 5G, it's going to enable a, an entanglement where our devices will actually be processing data and communicating data to another device. Um, and you're going to start to see uh, a, no more distinction between that core and edge. And, um, and with that comes, again, new opportunities. And with that comes new strategies that we're going to need for data protection, uh, for citizen safety, and for infrastructure resilience. Just to give you a perspective, again, on 5G versus 4G, 4G currently over a one kilometer radius allows for the connectivity of about 50 to 75,000 devices. But, one, uh, but 5G is going to really enable at least 10 times the capacity or 1 million devices within that 5G uh, aspect. It's going to enable the internet of things. These new devices that'll connect people, places and things and you'll have IP addresses associated with many different things that we need to, um, again, we're gonna to start to see innovation um, and we'll have to address some of the security stand, standpoints. So from an internet of things, <clears throat> we're also starting to talk about um, the, the 5G, there's a, uh, whether or not we should enable and push for broader innovation with an open radio access network or keep on the current path of standard proprietary standards. There's very few net, uh, tech, core technology providers right now. There's five, that's Ericsson, Nokia, Samsung, Huawei, and CTE. But there's a push by the international community, both hardware and software vendors of, can we have an open radio access network, an open innovation standard so that everybody can participate in the 5G ecosystem and we can expand it to more and more users. So open radio access network and the ORAN Alliance um, really allows for further disaggregation, more APIs or application interfaces, allows for multiple vendors and interoperability among vendors and, and further disaggregates. Um, and with that, some of the benefits, you know, it allows for avoiding vendor lock-in, you reduce your costs, it's a bit quicker time to market. And this, the group and the alliance and the um, and the telecommunications infrastructure and these and the software and hardware providers are working to try to build that interoperability between 2G, 3G, 4G, with general purpose neutral hardware software defined um, networks. And again, that allows for more market entrance into this. It allows for a new innovation, of which I'll talk about. It allows for um, Again, multiple vendors uh, to have that interoperability and interfaces so that there can be multiple innovations on uh, the cloud and the 5G backbone. And it expands the ecosystem of the different uh, companies that can participate from small and medium enterprises all the way up to the large enterprises. And you're already starting to see some of this, um, this innovation uh, 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 in, in multiple different areas. Uh, and you in Pakistan had your first uh, 5G network deployed in 2019 with Zong, and you're starting to see that innovation start to emerge in Pakistan. This, this backbone of 5G as we start to get it and the interoperability between 3G, 4G and 5G is gonna be important because we're right now around the world connecting at least 127 devices to the internet 
every second. And there are many countries that are now starting to accelerate their innovation and their um, funding from research and development to modernization plans to enable this contactless society. And what does that mean? Well, in the post-COVID era, we're going to um, have new things. Our cell phones will have a Bluetooth associated with it that will open the door in front of us and that will identify us as we walk into our buildings. Um, the Internet of Things is going to enable the businesses to have new business processes uh, to improve the customer experience, to save time and, in theory, money, enhance our productivity as employees, but enhance productivity as us as nations, and integrate and adopt new business models. Again, though, the Internet of Things, this proliferation of connected devices, many of which have not been um, designed well, they have flaws, um, security flaws in them, um, is going to enable or create exponential risks because we are seeing explosive growth of data. We're seeing more autom automation. And um, with that vulnerability, we have to start to manage the risks associated with it. But as we're doing that, and we're embracing these technologies, we're seeing the pathway being for industry 4.0, um, is what we call it, you call that in Pakistan, we call it industry 4.0, but Japan and South Korea, and when you go further east, they call it society 5.0, because they see this technology is interacting more with our elderly or with our young um, and creating new ways to, um, to really kind of drive our society and the modernization. And so just a few case study examples, you know, this right now over the last year plus, we've had the work from home and learn from home and a 1200% increase in the use of these collaboration tools. And um, it has enabled us to stay connected to us as each other as families, to us each other as academia, to us as each other and our businesses and, and the like. And we've adapted pretty well, I think. Um, and I, I see this as a foreseeable future trend, less travel, more online connectivity. We're also seeing the deployment of new technologies to enable smart agriculture. And since agriculture is 22% of your GDP, this becomes really important. You're seeing IP devices on the crops um, in order to understand if they need water or fertilizer. You're seeing robots actually conduct the spraying of the of the fertilizer or the conducting the watering, et cetera. You're seeing drones used to monitor the crops. Um, you're also seeing IP devices being deployed onto cattle and or chickens in order to know from farm to table, where have they grazed? What types of, uh, um, have they been, uh, where have they been, et cetera. And it really helps with the increase the production through the use of the technology. We're also seeing the deployment of, uh, of smart factories and advanced manufacturing deploying this internet-based technology. In some countries, they're, uh, they're uh, using what we call lights out factories where the robots are doing the majority of the work and the personnel are just monitoring the robots and the productivity that's on the lines. I actually had the opportunity to see one of these um, lights out factories up in and China, and I also saw one in Canada, and it was really quite remarkable. You had machines moving things all around. You had the machines actually conducting the, building the car, um, and very few people having to be in the factory. They were all behind the scenes running the computers and then running the computers that run these machines. It was really quite fascinating. We're also seeing smart cities deployed all around the world. Um, uh, they're, uh, you know, and you've got the capital smart city where you're looking at applying that digital technology to empower and connect communities. You're, it's for smart housing, it's for smart environment, it's for sustainable development. And, um, and you see these again emerging, it's going to require more connectivity, the 5G deployment in order to start to really reap the benefits of these things. But smart capital, smart, the capital smart city is the first of what I think are many that is designed for Pakistan. You're also seeing um, e-health uh, uh, and especially over this last year, 
uh, turning to the technology in order to help um, our communities, whether that's conducting a remote visit over something like Zoom or using the connected devices to monitor your um, heart rate or your um, insulin pumps for diabetes uh, and or unlocking the, the different sets of data to actually start to control health costs and, and, and controlling health care more broadly. And remote communities, we're actually seeing the deployment of, uh, of robots, again, remotely um, being used for surgeries, et cetera. Um, and so you're seeing, this, uh, and I think, an acceleration of the advancement of our healthcare industry enabled through this, um, enabled really through the adoption from COVID. Um, and, and, uh, and I think that you're gonna start to see new innovations here in the healthcare industry as well over the course of the next one to three years. Overall, as we adopt and embed 5G into all of our country's infrastructures, you're going to see a $13 trillion economic um, infusion uh, by 2035. So you think about that, it's another 13% of the global economy that will be generating or becoming more digital. So by 2035, we should be all around the world, at least at 25 to 30% of our digital, of that economy will be digital. And it's important as our countries are embracing um, like digital Pakistan, the broadband policy, the releasing spectrum, um, thinking about cybersecurity. These are all the things that all of our countries are starting to address and we're addressing them in, in multiple paths. One is the economic modernization agenda. And the second is, can we ensure resilience and security of those core industries and infrastructures as we're moving forward? And our countries and our companies are just racing to capture this digital economy um, and the digital opportunity. Each of the different verticals, whether it's healthcare, agriculture, manufacturing, mining, each of the different verticals are all embracing in, in, uh, the digital opportunity and modernizing and, and, and connecting more and more of their business processes, designs, et cetera, to the internet. But the numbers really don't look very good when you start to look at what's happening with the vulnerabilities in this internet of things um, and uh, as we're thinking, as we're moving forward. We've seen in the last year, a 715% increase in ransom attacks. And the ransom attacks are, um, are literally out of control around the world. Ransom attack is something where a, a malicious actor has gained access illegally to your network, usually through an unpatched um, software or th through an unpatched software. And they're able to gain access to your network they encrypt your data and most likely your capital equipment with the intent of extorting a ransom from you in order to unlock your files and unlock your enterprise. And this is happening again in, at, at an unprecedented pace and scale around the world. We've also seen 150% increase in distributed denial of service attacks. Distributed denial of service attacks are when um, your telecommunications or your enterprise gets flooded with too many requests and it actually knocks you offline when you need to be online. When this happens at a telecommunications core, it becomes very difficult because they can no longer provide service, whether that's moving your data or your voice communications. And then again, because of the proliferation of that 127 new devices every second to the internet that are generally designed with vulnerabilities in place, that we're seeing a 600% increase in internet of things attacks. So meaning I'm actually going after the vulnerability in that internet of thing device, whatever that might be, a baby monitor to your cell phone. And then that also will enable a distributed denial of service attack or a ransom attack. And the 5G, while it brings great benefits, like you know, benefits of speed, throughput, low latency, this new functionality through the software-defined networking, as well as the network functionalities that's become more virtualized and at the edge or in the cloud, there comes an, a downside. There's this expanded attack surface. And so you start to see the reliability and availability of our infrastructures might be at risk. 
you see an, an, a demand or a, a need for virtualization security. The, the standards behind 5G are behind on getting the security, reliability, resilience um, metrics embedded in them. We just saw the first set in the standards this summer. And, um, and we need to, as governments and as industry, to demand higher standards from the community to ensure that our interoperability maintains its integrity as well as its availability and that we can ensure safety, security, and resilience of the infrastructures as we deploy them. And we, when we're talking about this deployment of some of these Internet of Things or any of these new um, technologies, it would help us to look at the past or what's currently going on with our uh, software vendors. The most products come with the principle of field it fast and fix it later. We're Patch Tuesday, which happens once a month for some vendors, sometimes it's once a quarter, leads to Vulnerable Wednesday for you as an enterprise or you as a nation. And we need to really, we need to address this vulnerability head on because patching our future at 127 devices per second is unsustainable. And just to give you a perspective of two American vendors that are widely globally deployed, uh, in 2020, there was more than 1,200 uh, vulnerabilities addressed by Microsoft, of which over, you know, at least 10% were critical. Critical meaning I could gain access to your network um, if you had not patched it. Um, and the zero days mean that I had access all the way up until the, the patch was made. Uh, and Oracle, uh, because it's such an important business platform, it, it, it patches quarterly. And this past year, it had over 1,600 uh, vulnerabilities, one third of which were critical. And when you start to think about that, that's just two vendors. That doesn't include all the other vendors that have some patch cadence to them. And you as IT professionals um, have to start to prioritize which one has to come first, second, and third and understand the value at risk to my enterprise. What data might I lose? What protected information might I lose? Is it my intellectual property? Is it real money, et cetera? And those unpatched systems are very easy to find on the internet. There is a, a free for service uh, uh, software called showdan.org that allows you to find those unpatched systems on that vulnerable Wednesday. And so then, I can easily go find those, um, those unpatched systems. And if I'm a good attacker or malicious actor, it only takes me seconds to gain access to your networked infrastructure, to gain access to your data. And the tools are very readily available, as so is the service um, uh, by these malicious actors. It only costs me a dollar, one US dollar, in order to uh, gain access to somebody's computer it's only a few US dollars in order to steal your national identity. And it's only $10 an hour to conduct a distributed denial of service attack against your, uh, against your network. These become issues. And it, these issues become even more apparent when you look at what is the patching cadence of our enterprises. Most of our companies, it takes them 30 days to implement the 100 patches that came out from Microsoft or the hundred or 400 that came out from Oracle, but our small and medium enterprises, they never patch. And the, those that are in between, it takes them 60 to 90 days. So if you think about between just two vendors, that there were almost 3000 patches for the year, um, you have a window of vulnerability, whether it's 30 days or 90 days or always, where these unpatched systems could be manipulated and accessed by an adversary. Um, and there's a lot at risk. So let's talk about some of those things. First of all, it's real money. The financial institutions are in fact losing money and they have um, personal identifiable information um, on all of us that do our banking with them. And, and so there's two aspects of why I would go after a financial system. First is to take and steal the money. Second is to steal the personal identifiable information because I can monetize it on the internet or sell it. Second, <clears throat> healthcare informa information and other personal information is readily available. And if you think about it from not just healthcare institutions, 
or our insurance companies that are collecting really protected data, but you can think of it as retail and travel and leisure. And there are many industries that are collecting a lot of data about us. And if they don't protect it, then again, it's easily monetized on the underground economy. Again, your personal uh, uh, national identity card is worth about $3 on the underground market. My credit card uh, is worth about a dollar um, and the like. So when you steal hundreds of thousands or hundreds of millions of records, that's a lot of money. Many of our companies, especially in the United States, are uh, losing their intellectual property. It's being illegally copied by uh, nations that are then taking it back to advance the interests of their country and their corporations. Um, and this becomes again, a big problem for all of us as we're starting to see um, unfair trade practices among other things that are coming with this stolen intellectual property. We're seeing business disruption. The free flow of goods, services, data and capital across border is, is being um, challenged through denial of service attacks, again, knocking you offline when you need to be online, through censorship of content takedown, through ransomware that encrypts and uh, makes your files and data and even your equipment no longer accessible. And business disruption was a significant challenge globally in 2020. And I think it will continue to be a problem as we're going forward. And then we're seeing real destructive malicious software that is intended to wipe or destroy your capital equipment. And in some cases you're seeing that with ransomware. Not only are they illegally copying your data and posting it in the underground economy or for sale on Reddit or some other place, but they're actually also wiping your infrastructure um, and so rendering the equipment uh, useless. And I can give many examples on that. So, we need to start to future-proof our infrastructure. As we're talking about cybersecurity, as we're talking about broadband, as we're talking about and in deploying 5G around the world, we need to start thinking and talking about resilience, that we need to start talking about safety, and we need to architect that way, and we need to architect it into not only our enterprises, but we need to architect it into our policies and regulations. And um, Pakistan has a number of draft policies you know, you uh, published your spectrum uh, strategy in November of 2020, uh, your broadband strategy and your cybersecurity policy were both um, in draft, uh, just published in uh, the end of January. And in those, the policies start to recognize how important it is to think about um, cybersecurity on, of uh, online data, of the ICT products, the information communications technology products and the systems as we're deploying them and as we embrace the internet of things and we connect to 5G. And then the, the broadband uh, policy is focusing on the important things, accessibility, usability, and market enablement, drive the innovation, which was one of the things in Pakistan's um, uh, uh, digital agenda, and then drive digital trust and transformation, that this is a journey that we're all on if we can start to connect um, more apps and start to innovate at the edge but also build security and resilience in, you will reap the rewards and your digital economy will grow. And that requires really thinking of, you know, that the industry 4.0 and society 5.0 must be architected with resilience, with safety, with security and privacy in mind. We can no longer allow for these internet of things devices to be deployed with vulner known vulnerabilities with the, the principle of field it fast and fix it later. We really have to start to drive toward an architecture that thinks about how we're going to innovate with that security resilience embedded. Some ways to think about this and um, is, you know, the EU has published its 5G toolbox. It's both strategic um, measures and technical measures. And thinking about how do you strengthen the security requirements for mobile network operators, assessing the risk of, uh, of suppliers, uh, applying some restrictions to suppliers that are considered high risk or those who don't invest in the security or safety of their products. Uh, and then thinking about a multi-vendor strategy, not getting locked into one company or one technology, giving yourself that flexibility. 
And so there's strategic measures and there's technical measures within that, you know, thinking about network security and 5G specific measures that are articulated by the government and adopted and embedded by the, um, by the providers into their cores of their technology and really demanding resilience and continuity. So it's, it's not just about the availability of the technology, it's about the resilience the being able to restore quickly the business continuity disaster recovery aspects. The EU 5G toolbox is really just a, a framework of how to think about it. It's not um, directive in nature. And so it allows for each of the member states to think about things um, differently. There's also been, um, as you start to think about internet of things and embracing more of those things for your business processes, there are three sets of guidance that have come out recently that also help with thinking about that resiliency and security. Uh, the first comes is the code of practice that was uh, articulated in, um, uh, by Australia just in uh, November of 2020, so just a few months old. And um, how do you start to think about securing of the internet of things? And as you have multiple internet of things, how do you start to architect that overall, uh, the networked environment um, as we move forward. We also had ANISA, which is the European um, uh, Union's uh, Agency for Cybersecurity, uh, published some guidelines for securing the internet. How do you think about the supply chain and all of the different vendors that are connected in that ecosystem, enabling the interoperability, but also embedding security within it. And then GSMA, which is one of the, um, the uh, industry uh, associations associated with telecom, um, they also provided an IoT security, especially as we're starting to move forward and embrace 5G. These are all resources to help think about the architecture, building resilience in future-proofing our infrastructures. I also think that it's important at a national level, and this is starting to come underway with the different strategies and policies that are in draft right now in Pakistan, but it's important to conduct an all-encompassing assessment of what are the most critical digital dependencies of the country, the companies, the infrastructures, the services, the assets that if harmed would cause both an economic issue and a national security issue. And this is where you can start to prioritize the investments of where you need to uh, modernize and how you need to draw down risk. When you look at Pakistan and you look at where its export imports dependencies are, the exporters clearly in, um, you know, the, and, and uh, fabrics and, uh, and, and agriculture, and you're sending it to the United States, to China, to Germany, to Spain. So these are kind of the key for driving your economy. And then from an import perspective, it's the mineral fuels, um, oils, et cetera. And you're primarily coming in from China, UAE, et cetera. This gives you one lens on the key things of what's important for your economy um, as far as what you're exporting and to whom, uh, as far as alliances and trade. And then the imports, again, of what is are you completely dependent upon in order to drive your economy and what are the key countries that are, are, that are enabling that. So then you can start to say, what's important? I have, my top priorities are, uh, I am going to embrace the digital um, digitalization of my agriculture industry because it already represents 22% of my GDP. And you reflect that in the digital agenda or the industrial policy, and you start to put more money in research and development. And I highlight these things in the national cybersecurity strategy. You look at your export strategy or your foreign direct investment and how do you attract businesses to come to Pakistan to innovate and continue to drive your economy. I think it's also important to identify the top companies that represent 2% or more of the country's GDP because these are the companies that need and uh, will require extra attention to ensure that they're resilient and driving that ecosystem and architecture going forward. And then those most critical infrastructure services and assets that if they were to be brought offline when they need to be online, how quickly could we restore them? The meantime to restore um, and ensure that you have that as a resilient infrastructure nation um, as you go forward. From government's perspective, you need to think about the incentive structure of how do you get to quick adoption. Some countries and like Japan has um, implemented tax credits for its industry. 
uh, to really uh, adopt the, and, and innovate using 5G and um, cloud-based infrastructures. Other countries are looking at subsidization um, or rate recovery for the telecommunications infrastructure um, as they invest to build out and get to uh, broadband to the last mile um, and get 5G towers stood up um, and migrate from 3G to 4G. There are still other countries that are thinking about regulation and fines, um, inspection regimes and minimum standards of care. Uh, and there's no really one right path, but thinking about a balance of both incentives and penalties will likely get you a faster um, adoption rate and, 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 and accelerate the innovation curve. It's important that governments are transparent and even companies are transparent in their decision-making of the choices that they're making. Why they went with a particular vendor, was it cost or was it about security? Or why is a, is, is a vendor or a country considered high risk? Uh, these are important for all of our countries to be transparent. And right now, this is a, this is a challenge in, in so many of our countries, um, either companies are making decisions or countries are making decisions that is, is, is actually starting to inhibit the interoperability of the technologies and the free flow of data across and capital across borders. It's important to raise awareness and develop the skills. People don't all understand what 5G is or what the internet of things is or why cybersecurity or resilience is important to the future of our economy or our infrastructures. And so if we can start to uh, incubate this, not only at the national level of our leadership, of our governments and our industry, but also with the younger generation that is gonna be the next generation in the workforce or our next set of innovators, it's really important to help just um, translate what's going on and why it's important to each and every one of us. I had worked on a few frameworks on uh, how to think about this cybersecurity or a better posture for the future. The cyber readiness index is something that I worked on um, for uh, when I left the government and it's published in all six UN languages and there's 15 country studies done of how do you start to think about the economic alignment with the security and resilience of a country. We've, I worked on a team for the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, along with the World Bank and, and others. Um, we put together this guide to developing a national cybersecurity strategy, which clearly is looks at like something that your government, um, the Pakistani government and uh, the Ministry of, of uh, Information and uh, Technology and Telecom used in order to start to draft their policy. And then I have worked on the third one of how do you manage national digital risk um, for the Organization of American States. All of these are available in all the UN languages published up on the internet and available to help guide your perspective on digital risk management and the adoption of these technologies as going forward to advance our economies. The most important thing I think though is to align the digital agenda of the country with the security needs. Usually we have one part of our government talking about productivity, efficiency, modernization, and GDP growth, whether that's the Ministry of Finance or the Ministry of Economics or the Ministry of Commerce. But on the other side, we have a, a security apparatus, whether it's our military or intelligence service, et cetera, that's talking about, we really need to think about infrastructure resilience or intellectual property protection as we're uh, moving forward our economy and our industries data protection um, and data privacy, and then overall uh, defense of our country and, and political stability. These two need to be aligned and brought together in the same conversation because they're really two sides of the same coin. Um, as we embrace the technology and the modernization, we always have to make sure that we've thought about the resilience, the safety, the security, the privacy as we move forward. Because right now we're in the middle of this digital transformation, it's now. And we need to think about it. Are we ready and resilient? And I'm hoping that this conversation tonight helps us break down some of those barriers and we can start to think about all the opportunity with 5G and we can start to responsibly manage the risks that are going to be associated with the next generation telecom and all the internet of things and the things that we're going to connect through it. Thank you so much. And I look forward to your questions and our conversation. Mm. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, that was a fascinating presentation and a lot of good insight, uh, particularly from your experience uh, working with the government on these issues. Um, 
So uh, just to kind of start off the questions and then we'll go to the audience uh, Q&A. Um, so we're approaching the two year uh, anniversary of the first launch of 5G back in April of 2019. Um, and you know, in, in, as with many technologies, there's an early uh, sort of phase of anticipation and expectation of what these technologies will do, uh, which, which sometimes um, uh, quickly outpace people's uh, or uh, underperform people's expectations. So wh where do you think we are in, in the development of the expectations of what 5G can bring? And particularly for countries like Pakistan, who are uh, not necessarily the early adopters like many other countries, um, what lessons can developing countries who have not yet uh, started their 5G rollouts learn from those early movers? That's a great question. Thanks, Aaron. I think that um, uh, I think all of our countries are on a different maturity curve, and right now. Um, 5G, the current benefits is that you notice that you can stream video to your cell phone um, and that your cell phone is just as, as able to take on a lot more um, uh, uh, rich content, et cetera. Um, but as you start to advance and you start to um, like accelerate or incubate more innovative new applications that connect to those, cell, those mobile devices, or can connect to the cloud, you'll start to see, I think, an emergence of new new industries and and um, and new things. I mean, if you think about just this past year of um, how uh, the marketplace had to innovate in order to connect citizen to a service, whether that was a citizen to grocery store or that was a citizen to pay their taxes or a citizen to do these different things, it all went online. And so you saw, uh, you know, you saw more innovation at the edge, uh, and it doesn't have to come from a, a steadfast, you know, uh, company that's been around 100 years. It can come from, you know, a, a student at a university or even in high school that has created some unique applications that are part of this, you know, emerging new economy. So. Um, where are uh, lessons learned that you can uh, you can turn to? Uh, I think when you look at um, the Japan has given tax incentives to their industry to innovate, and um, Rakuten, um, which is a company that's most known for like retail sales here in the United States, is actually a big now cloud provider and has got a partnership with Intel and other companies to create this. Uh, edge cloud um, interaction. And so there's there's an incubation there. Um, and in other cultures and economies, you're seeing, uh, again, different uh, adaptations of the technology to drive new industries or, um, or new technologies within an industry. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, we have two questions related to spectrum uh, from the audience. So the first one, um, how much wireless spectrum in terms of megahertz and which frequency uh, is required by a cellular operator to roll out 5G? And sort of following on that, what kind of tech and touch spectrum is feasible for a country like Pakistan in terms of 5G adoption? Um, the, um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm great. It's great that we have the, the technology, the, uh, the, the deep tech questions. Um, and uh, I'm going to get part of this wrong because the millimeter waves that are um, that are showing for the 5G are different spectrum rollout for each of our different countries. Um, and so um, I'm just going to look at a note here and see if I have some of this written. Um, which I don't have it readily available, but there's certain spectrum bands that have to be uh, released um, in order to enable the 5G. Uh, in, in the United States, actually, some of this has been reserved for our emergency telecommunications infrastructure, as well as our military. And so we're so you're starting to see these spectrum auctions happen around the world, which was part of what your spectrum strategy in November 2020 started to highlight of what needed to be part of that spectrum auction. You're seeing it in other countries as well. Um, and it's not only the mobile operator that can buy or that you're seeing buy the spectrum. <clears throat> in fact, in Germany, the top 40 industries, especially those that were in manufacturing, thank you, um, the, those that were in manufacturing, um, they actually bought spectrum in order to run their own uh, local 5G networks 
um, for like automobile industry, et cetera. So I thought that was interesting. So the spectrum isn't necessarily only for the telecommunications or the mobile operators uh, to enable the 5G towers. It is actually being bought by companies to enable their manufacturing. And thank you uh, to the panel, to the persons who are, are putting in the megahertz in the, uh, in the chat window. Thank you. Great. And, and if I could just ask one follow-up question to that. So um, as the government here, at least, is uh, is working to sort of um, on the next phase of their, their spectrum auctions, what are some of the best practices you've seen in other countries that, um, you know, uh, countries like Pakistan that are starting to do this in, in greater frequency and put out more spectrum that they can uh, try to leverage from other experience? Well, I think it's important to um, be thoughtful in how you're releasing the spectrum. Um, and uh, so I would say in the United States, we're, we're behind um, because we were slow to uh, sell the uh, sell it. And that was large, that partially was because of military considerations or not emergency telecommunications. But you still wanna have the ability that if there was a national crisis that you have the ability to go and tap into that spectrum um, shut it off for those things. So I would think that you need to be, it needs to be thoughtful of not just sell it all because that's what we need for the economy, but think about resilience of the country and where, and if you were to um, think about those things. Um, I also think it's important to look at what other countries have done of, uh, can anybody buy the spectrum? Is it have to be, is it your mobile and, and your and, and the, the telecom operators or can it be industry that's buying the spectrum? I thought that was what was really interesting about Germany, that industry could also, big manufacturing or the big companies could buy it for their own needs. Um, and so that is a, I think, I'm not sure it's a best practice, but it's certainly something to observe that happened in Europe. Um, and then, sorry, and, um, the, I think the last thing is to, uh, will you allow any foreign, foreign telecom operators to buy the spectrum in your national plan? And the answer to that would be no in the United States, uh, but that's something to also be considerate of. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so uh, next question from one of the audience members is, what is your take on the digital literacy uh, or, the, or the illiteracy that a population for developing countries face? 5G will create access, but access doesn't mean usage. How do marginalized populations embrace 5G and associated technology? Yeah, so this is, gets to the um, sustainable development goals that the United Nations has published and that many of our countries are mapping to, that um, just because you have access to the technology does not necessarily mean it's usable or is going to drive or, or uh, close the knowledge gap. So I, I think that uh, the, it, this needs to be mapped into skills development and education of how you can drive new ways to access um, actually even remote education, uh, I think is gonna be important. Um, and I put together, um, to, um, you'll probably find it on the internet or I can give you access to it, but I, I've given a couple of, of talks about how different countries are, um, are uh, using the technology in order to get to help children of different ages to get those skill sets. Um, and whether it's using comic books um, or cartoons, or it's going through clubs or science fiction novels, there's multiple different pathways that different countries are using in order to drive the skills development using the technology uh, now that you have the available technology and hopefully it's also affordable technology. Um, if it's not affordable, then the government has to spend the time in order to get it not only accessible to the last mile, but affordable as well. And that is, that's actually something I'm advocating here. In the United States, we are a, a clearly a very rich country, but we have a, not a lot of good available um, telecommunications in our rural areas. And it's really affecting our younger population at this point because they can't do school from home, they actually have to drive 20 to 30 miles in order a long way uh, in order to gain accessible um, uh, uh, telecommunications that has been provided for free by a, like a Walmart or a Verizon, one of our telecommunications providers. But otherwise, we have a long way to go in this country, in the United States, to make it available and affordable and accessible to everybody. 
Okay. Um, so you talked a little bit about the kind of the, the opportunities for the economic development. What can the governments do to promote investment in 5G technology by uh, multinational organizations and service providers, um, to, I, basically also IoT service providers? Yeah, I think that um, when I look at some of the countries that they are creating innovation parks or they're dedicating certain areas that um, could be a free trade zone um, or, uh, or you know, a research and development tech park that has incentives. And in fact, I was just uh, in 2020 last year, I was in um, Kyrgyz Republic uh, where they had basically dedicated a research park in uh, Bishkek in their capital. And you can look at that as, you know, Israel having built an entire tech park with their governments, um, their military, their intelligence service, their academia, and um, in the desert. And then they had, uh, you know, a lot of foreign direct investment in that area to incubate and innovate for cybersecurity and advanced technology. I look at Israel as being the beacon of one of the countries that's done it the best. And then I see these little, these pockets all over the world whether it's Chile um, down in South America, they had a innovation park that was funded partially by um, the uh, uh, telecom operator. So everybody got free internet. And then they created a, um, a, 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 a foreign direct investment strategy where if you came, uh, you got a, a, a really a sophisticated work visa um, in order to incubate your new technology there. And then, um, and part of the quid pro quo for the work visa, the free telecom and all of these other things was, again, this is the Chilean government. You had to give back to the community and teach at a university. So you got a foreign direct investment of a company coming in and um, all of the things that enabled that to happen. And so you're driving that innovation and then you're also teaching the community either through the school system or giving a seminar or whatever on whatever that expertise is that you had. So it created this really interesting bi-directional um, win-win for the community. So if I were advising the Pakistani government, I would be thinking about that innovation park um, how do you get the first, second, and third multinational corporation that's going to invest in, and drive that? Can you provide free telecommunications infrastructure in a place to um, create that hub zone for the innovation of the, of the small businesses to try to, um, to really kind of embrace the technology and drive the ecosystem? There's lots of different opportunities to do that. And you could look at it in multiple, ci multiple city um, uh, strategy associated with that. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, uh, kind of on a, on a related point, um, you know, one of the, the the sort of participants from tonight said that the, you know the the aspiration for Pakistan is not to kind of have just faster streaming and, and video services. Um, how do we ensure we get the five G uh, ecosystem available and that five G is used for more meaningful use cases in Pakistan? So I, I think it goes back to um, where, where are you driving and what is the economic strategy for Pakistan? What are the core industries that are, are um, important? Where are the emerging industries that can become more digitized and start to look at that? So it starts with where's the vision for the country? Where are you driving it for the next, let's just say three to five years? Then second, it has to be, I think, a research and development strategy around that. Um, of what and where does the government need to invest in and where can it attract foreign direct investment to complement that research and development. Third, I think you have to look at the, um, the regulatory environment and the overall stability of how do you create tax incentives or an incentive structure versus a penalization or regulatory structure uh, so that you're not inhibiting or stifling innovation. Uh, and then I think the, the fourth thing is, is that how do you then create not only the foreign direct investment and that research of driving better use cases, whether it's in agriculture, manufacturing, um, or uh, renewable or new technology, new, new energy um, and the like, but could you also create an export strategy around that of how you're going to drive that further? And I think that was what was so interesting about um, Israel is Israel said that they wanted to be a you know a top five nation in cybersecurity. 
uh, and it first was a research and development, build the ecosystem and uh, get the foreign direct investment. But now they're one of the number one exporters of cybersecurity technology and providing advice around the world. So I look at that as they built it, they invested in it, and then they were enable it to be a new, a new um, uh, uh, generation of their economy um, and, and, and an important pillar. It took them 10 years. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, another question from the audience is, um, is it possible for democratic governments to maintain digital freedom rights through 5G and other networks without getting it, uh, without exploitation for political purposes? Can you repeat that again, Aaron? I'm sorry. Um, it, basically, they're, they're wondering, is it possible for democratic governments to maintain uh, digital freedom of expression um, as 5G comes online um, without basically exploitation for kind of political purposes by people involved. So maybe, you know, could be a cybersecurity kind of component or maybe some disinformation type uh, issue. Yeah, I think that um, the, so 5G and because um, it's, there's no longer a distinction between the edge and the core. And so my device will connect potentially to Aaron's device, which will connect to somebody else's device. And we'll have this data passing through, uh, you know, even through our cars that it'll be very hard to control the flow of data um, like we currently have the ability to do. And so I think that you will see more, um, more challenges in the future because governments are going to want to control data flows, um, whether that's content takedown um, or, uh, or uh, try to block certain, you know, whether it's, I don't know if you want to call it censorship or actually deny the internet service, which you've seen down in India um, and you've seen in other places where they actually just, just take the whole internet offline so you can't communicate, which is very damaging to the economy. Uh, and so I, I do believe that you're going to see uh, future challenges and it's currently playing out in the censorship regime and content takedown regimes around the world and also a tax regime and so there's a digital services tax being uh, talked about <clears throat> around the world of um, that if you're a, a content provider, or you're an over the top provider uh, like a Netflix or um, uh, that you have to now pay an extra tax in order to fund the telecommunications infrastructure because you're currently getting what free ride uh, on top. And so you're starting to see that anywhere from 3% being discussed at the OECD countries uh, but Singapore and, and Indonesia are, are over 10% digital tax. And this is in addition to a value added tax. And so you start to see this as an emerging regime that we're gonna be thinking about um, certainly more and more as you're seeing more disinformation on the internet or being, it being used to um, uh, enable, um, quote unquote, enable political stability. So denial of internet uh, availability so you cannot communicate or um, or uh, demanding content takedown. Right. Okay. Well, thank you. So I think we're um, we're out of time, and then maybe we'll just ask one more question to kind of finish things off. Um, so you you talked a little bit about um, the IoT risk, and you also talked about some opportunities from kind of some emerging technologies such as uh, open. Uh, open radio access network. Um, as policymakers start to navigate these kind of emerging issues, um, what advice do you have for regulators to kind of, uh, again, through, through, through a lot of the research that you've done already, um, to sort of consider these and what are the opportunities, particularly around open RAN? Yeah, so I, I think that um, the open RAN uh, provides for um, that interoperability allows for uh, uh, many market entrants. Um, uh, it allows for, you know, neutral um, vendor selection and et cetera. So uh, it really just promotes interoperability and many market entrants. And so if you're trying to create a new ecosystem and you're trying to drive innovation and get a, um, accelerate your digital economy, you, you will probably want to embrace the, the ORAN, the open radio access network technology, so you don't have one or three or four vendors that you're locked into, that you can have lots of different companies participate. New small and medium uh, businesses start to incubate and drive that technology. And from a regulatory perspective, you can actually 
demand that it's an open market versus a proprietary market. And then um, and start to ensure that you're driving the market economy of where you want it to be and and uh, and where you're uh, you're going. I think it'll also be important again as uh, the telecommunications infrastructure of making sure that the telco operators are thinking about it from that market economy multiple entrance and not getting locked into one or two vendors uh, because in many places the the telecommunications providers are the ones that are making the decisions about um, where things are going. And then uh, finally, an over-regulated market then many times does stifle the innovation. So thinking about when regulation is important to open the market or close the market based on whatever reasons, hopefully they're transparent. But then um, second, the under or you know the light touch regulation, usually like the EU, 5G toolbox or other things as guidance, it, it, it usually does in fact accelerate the economic development um, and with the vision of it being sustainable, you know, kind of the total cost of ownership that you're moving forward um, with the, the technologies. Great, thank you so much. Um, so Melissa, thank you for a great presentation, a great Q and A. Uh, thank you to our audience for all the great questions. Sorry, we didn't get a chance to get through all of them. Um, we will share a copy of the presentation with, uh, with those who have uh, signed in. And um, again, we thank you for your time and, and for taking part in this event. So have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Have a nice evening.